listening to The Cooler Ring, a podcast made for manufacturing marketers. Here are Carmen Perry and Jeff White. Welcome to The Cooler Ring, a podcast for manufacturing marketers brought to you by Cooler Partners. My name is Jeff White. Joining me today is Carmen Perry. Carmen, how are you doing, sir? Look, all is well. All is well. I, I'm I'm really excited for today's show. I am. I am too. Yeah, it's an area that uh, you especially have a, a fair amount of experience in uh, in the space, and uh, and we've been associated in kind of a similar industry with some old legacy clients that we used to have. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll admit. I I mean, it's weird if you've spent some time in the contract furniture space. There, there's a weird little. I don't know, like. There's a collection of people that are there and that are really nerdy about that space. And so once you kind of get into it and get introduced to it, it, uh, it does stick with you. And uh, yeah, so I think like, we may, today's guest might be uh, the most comfortable guest in the history of the cooler ring, um, if the seat that he's sitting in is any indication. <laughs> yeah, you may be right. Certainly more comfortable in these stools that I'm sitting on right now. But, uh, you know, I feel like with you, with what you just said about, you know, not being able to get away from the contractor or the contract furniture business, you know, it feels like there needs to be like a poly walnuts kind of thing, you know, where I thought I was out and then they pulled me back in. And he, he just, uh, yeah, yeah, Jeff, Jeff, uh, you finally, you finally did it. You were able to make a Sopranos reference during COVID. <laughs> I mean, you've been working at it now for a couple hundred episodes. We finally yeah, I know, right? <laughs> it's not no country for old men. It'll have to do. <laughs> um, <laughs> so joining us today is Evan Hargraves. Evan is the Director of Global Product Marketing at Miller & Knoll. Welcome to the Cooler Ring, Evan. Welcome and uh, super excited to be on. I'm, I'm a huge fan of what you guys have been doing. It's uh, been really fun kind of listening and, and excited to be able to talk to you guys today. Evan, thank you so much. It's awesome to have you. It, it, um, uh, like I, I'm kind of like, where do we begin? Your, um, your space has undergone such a, such a dramatic shift in the last while. But look, before we jump in, let's just, maybe not everybody is as is, is, uh, steeped in the furniture, uh, office furniture, furnishings, built environment space as, as I once was. Uh, so maybe uh, uh, introduce our listeners to uh, Miller Knoll and, uh, and a little bit about how you got there, if you would. Yeah, no, Will, thank you. Um, so Miller Knoll, it's, uh, it's a collection of multiple brands that really... Uh, started to exist in the summer of 2021. And before that, it was really two large companies, Herman Miller. Um, and for those of you who may not be aware of Herman Miller, uh, you're probably aware of a lot of the products. So if you work in an office, you've probably sat on or seen a Aeron chair or many of the other chairs or cables that we we, um, we make. Or if you're at home or a movie, if you've watched a lot of movies, uh, think about Fraser. Uh, there's the Eames lounge chair, one of our most... Uh, comfortable and incredible chairs, more from kind of the, the home furnishings, mid-century modern. If you've seen any of that, you've seen a lot of uh, Herman Miller products. On the Knoll side, same thing, another wonderful mid-century modern, two great design brands, which is kind of a great connection here. Knoll, you think about Barcelona chairs, uh, also a lot of Florence Knoll products. There's a great kind of connected history um, through these companies, uh, but also in the office space. If you've, if you've kind of worked, like you said, in the contract furniture space, you would definitely be aware of kind of both companies, but also kind of the products we make. Um, my journey's kind of been a really interesting one. Um, I kind of really started almost in the B to C, D to C, and in kind of multiple kind of uh, product marketing parts. And so started off at Nike. Uh, been with a lot of big brands: Nike, Samsonite, Wilson. And what always kind of interested me in kind of a pivot, I kind of took a hard right turn into um, the 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 contract or the b2b space was really to learn and i think what was interesting is translating and, and what i felt was really kind of interesting coming into the space was um, how i could take a set of skills from one area and kind of change into another one getting that translation and kind of finding some new opportunities to learn uh, little did i know that uh, a lot of what i was doing in the past is going to come into kind of where the future is kind of the pandemic hit and, and kind of went from there so uh, been kind of quite an interesting journey I mean, and, and the uh, the pandemic really is that um, uh, that that pivot uh, for, for for you folks, where you really, I think you said it, you can't like this this notion of separating B to B and B to C just doesn't seem to fit anymore. You thought you were getting out of B to C, and all of a sudden you're right back in the heart of it. 
Yeah, and what was interesting, so when, when I joined Herman, Herman Miller seven years ago, we were kind of like two separate ships kind of going in two different path, like directions. We had a, a very strong retail business or a wholesale business. And um, we actually had a company called Design With Reach. They were kind of doing their separate thing. They were selling to people in their homes. And yeah, if you needed a home office, you could get a chair. But it was really selling a lot of things like dining furniture or lounge furniture, things like that. And then obviously a very direct kind of concentrated B2B business that was selling to offices because offices were this giant thing and, and completely different channels of, of kind of going to market, completely different things. And at that time, you kind of looked at like we were brand with a small B and kind of connected marketing, but not really, really focused in you know, how you would market to a contract B2B. You look at all the things that has been so great on your show, things like ABM, you, know, you look at all those digital marketing things. All I mean, all the things that I love about kind of your show, that was what we did. And then on the retail side, it was really about how you do conversion on your website. How do you bring people into stores? And that all had to change. Um, what was a brand with a little B and has become brand with a big B. Um, and really the interconnectedness of how we go to market has, has had to shift into like fifth gear pretty quickly. How have you... You know, that transition where you're no longer just selling to businesses that are, are looking to to furnish an office space or a commercial space of some description, you know, how do you think about if you're targeting people who aren't typically aware of, you know, these leading um, kind of almost architectural brands like Herman Miller and, and Knoll and things like that, how, how are you transitioning to branding more in the public eye and, and kind of bringing those brands to life for people who may not have heard of you because you're more of a, a professional brand than a consumer brand, I guess. What's interesting is if you kind of look back through the history of Herman Miller, um, especially through different periods of time, um, we've done that as part of what we've is part of our DNA. What's been really cool, and one of the things that really attracted me to Herman Miller is is some of that history. If you look through the 50s, what Charles and Ray Eames did, they were on national television talking about the things they did. And they really had that kind of brand history. And through different parts of time, we've kind of leaned into that. I think we even had a Super Bowl ad at one point. Um, so we've done those things. I think in the past, we've just kind of gotten away from it. And this was kind of like really kind of focusing back in our DNA. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the other part, right, is, is thinking through it in a different lens. And that was, was, I think where I was able to kind of come in and connect it's little things it's SEO It's it, that was a huge, but small thing within our industry was to understand. And, and this is both on a retail person who, who never knew about the brand, but it's also think about the, the contract B2B purchase. Like if you're a company, you're moving into a new office, you're going to do that once, right? And, you know, hopefully, and, and ideally as part of that, there's that research kind of element. You may not know about those brands until you have to do it. Um, and so there's, there's kind of similar but expanded process to doing it. So how does someone find your company? How do they research about it? Um, and how do you give that information for someone to learn in a simple way? It's really about buyer enablement. And then you have to put that on steroids for, for the retail end because people don't have that same time. They're not spending money. They're spending a lot of money to them. Think about like how expensive that purchase can be. But you make the corollary of if I'm a business and I'm spending potentially millions of dollars on outfitting multiple offices, that same kind of like level of content needs to be there. But the buying processes are longer and different. But you still have to do the same thing. You still have to give that rich content. You still have to engage. You have to inform but that attention span, and I think that was our biggest learning, that attention span for someone buying a chair online is completely different than a facilities planner that is going to be making a larger purchase for offices. I'm curious, is the is the sector seeing, I mean, there's certainly pressure, of course, as the, as the workforce kind of moves into this permanence of hybrid, uh, remote and office work, et cetera. But as I imagine somebody maybe kidding out a home office, they're, they're um, uh, financial reality may be a bit different than the way a facilities manager would be thinking about you know, outfitting a, a head office. Um, you know, they, you know, those that facilities manager may have more of a total cost of ownership lens uh, on the purchase, things of that sort. See the, you know, understand why a twenty-four hour task chair is important, to, you know, for somebody sitting in something for that long, et cetera. Um, ha have you had to really look at your product mix and, and change? 
change, you know, try to get, you know, basically a, 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 you know, lower price points, et cetera, to serve this more B2C uh, kind of target? That's a fantastic question. So I think as you look across the industry, that's definitely one of the approaches that we've done is kind of amplify some of that to a degree. Um, I think when you look at where our brand fits and where we're successful, I think that's one of the things when you look at like the brand side of things, is you have to stay in your lane. If you become, if you're a premium brand and then all of a sudden you become a discount brand, that that doesn't always end well. Um, part of what we've had to look at, and, and this is something that we were doing, but in a different way on the B2B side, was that education side. It's the explanation of and changing the value set and, and kind of positioning things in that way to say, this isn't about a chair that's going to last you for a month. Think about this chair is going to last. We have a 12-year warranty. Like that's a different buying context and understanding that journey and what you're getting for that. And, and as an investment for someone who's going to be spending a lot of time um, you know, working at your desk, like that's something is a comfort to kind of change that value equation and hopefully to educate people on kind of the benefits of that experience. And so what's always been interesting for me is I think about like, my my sporting goods background is all about explaining like well why would you want to buy a two hundred dollar soccer shoe? Well, you can do the same thing in a fifty dollar soccer shoe, but you can do it better if you really want to perform better. I think that same kind of analogy can come across to this space. You can sit in your dining chair and and try and do work, but at some point at the end of the day, your back might be going. Well, it's not feeling good. So I, I think there's some of that kind of not only performance side of things, but also what's been really exciting here. And we talk about the manufacturing side. Um, I get so geeked out on all the things we do in terms of local production, but also quality testing um, to really kind of say like 12 year warranty is a big thing. Um, and what those things are kind of change it. I want to talk just really briefly about that because I, I think it's an interesting choice to uh, because you know a warranty is a selling feature it's a marketing point it's all of those things what's why 12 years in and not lifetime or like is it was there a conscious reason to to go with that or, or is that based on you know data points that you have or what well this is interesting and this is where i'd want to kind of reflect on your guys experience of the contract for intermarket there's a a contract for instance association called bifma and all the larger um, contract furniture companies being Miller, Herman Miller, Knoll, Steelcase, Hayworth, kind of down the line, all connect to this broader association. And a lot of these standards become more industry wide. And, and that's kind of coming from that kind of legacy. Um, you know, part of the challenge with that lifetime, what does that really mean when it's lifetime? What's kind of there? Um, a lot of that is more as that historical side of, okay, if I'm doing a larger office purchase, what does that look like? How do I do replacement parts? Because we have a dealer network that's, that manages a lot of that, there's a lot of that legacy that kind of gets into that side of things. And so I think that's one of those interesting questions. I think the industry, as we pivot into more of that residential side, does that evolve? Um, I think that's definitely a great question and something we need to look at. But that's kind of the explanation why. Interesting. Were there, I mean, there had to have been some, uh, I mean, I know a lot of offices obviously shut down, but not every uh, B2B vertical uh, shut down during the pandemic. So were there, you know, were there some other pivots as well? Yeah, another great question. I think that's one of those things that everyone had to do a little bit of soul searching of like, how, how do we kind of keep this, you kind of like, we're doing one thing and all of a sudden you can't do that anymore. So how do we, how do we kind of pivot and how do we kind of make this, an ongoing uh, thing. And so for us, we've been diversified um, as it's kind of our, our broader set of companies. And that's what really kind of helped us kind of lean into that diversification. So if you look at the pandemic, um, one of the key areas that was, was obviously supercharged was the healthcare side of the business. And, you know, that's a, a big part of, of what we do is, is our healthcare vertical uh, is very strong. And that was one of the things that we kept working through and keep kept, I mean, there was two parts of this, right? There was obviously the business side, um, but there was also kind of the, how do we help the world in our own way? And I think that's one of the things that also really uh, connected me to this company was that kind of desire for, this is not just about the business. There's also that part of like, how do we help? Um, and I think that's what a lot of companies tried to do is like, how can you help in that, that time and what can you do? And I think that was a big part of like how we could do our thing to, to kind of keep it going. 
I, I think you know it's easy to be cynical to your point about oh well yeah the healthcare system was obviously under a lot of strain and they're not it's not closing down during the pandemic you know uh, the the cynic would say not the best time to be uh, maybe thinking of profiting from them right uh, so I think it is an important um, uh, a bit of context to say it, uh, you know thinking about it through the lens too of you know how how can we help in this particular situation well in 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 to the point where this is obviously we're talking about manufacturing to an end degree like our our manufacturing ops team you think about what they had to do at that time like they had to work in pretty tough conditions to come in and a lot of stress not knowing what was going on in in, in kind of indoor spaces to build something and yeah there's the business side of it but then there's also a a bigger part of like um, you know, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? And I think you kind of look at that. Um, you can't, there's a, I mean, our, our manufacturing side are craftsmen and they have a wonderful set of expertise of, of what they do to build the products they do. And I, I think that's kind of the soul of the company, right? We talk about like, that's an easy thing to forget, but I think that's the soul of what we do. Um, and to have that and, and part of that there, that to me, I think is so important. I'm really, um, you know, you're doing a great job, Evan, of kind of painting this picture of what it was like inside um, of Miller and Knoll as the pandemic's happening, and the different shifts that are, um, uh, the different shifts that are happening within the, the the marketing sales apparatus, and it's like it feels like it must have been like whack a mole. There was a lot of different changes happening at once. At the same time, as you're looking to focus more on healthcare and zero in there. And then you're looking at, okay, well, our brand needs to come to life more digitally, et cetera. You're also launching a gaming chair. Yeah, and that was was interesting is we had a, a separate team. At, what was interesting is like timing is always everything in the world. And, and we were fortuitous that we had started a lot of things. Obviously, we had started the retail side of the business. And that, was, um, that allowed us to pivot pretty quickly. Um, and then the gaming side, what was interesting, that was something that was already in development that we just kind of put kind of extra speed into um we kind of realized and this was always interesting and i always take this back to you know my old life is i think when you really have a dialogue with your customers and understand what people are doing sometimes people are are if you make a great product for one thing and it can kind of be used for an adjacent space um there's some things you can do to make it authentic but um i always look at my nike experience as kind of like the best mba i could have ever taken and what Nike has is something called the maxims. And one of their great maxims is let the, like the customer will decide for you. And, and if you listen and lean into your customer and understand what the customer is going, they will decide. And so there's kind of this great set of lore. If you're a, a sneaker head, there's a business called Nike SB. And so Nike SB really started from the observation that when people were skating, they were taking the Nike dunk and because it was a durable, it was a really durable shoe. And the same thing with the Jordan one shoe. They were using that to skate in because it was a great durable shoe. They had the right support. It worked really great on on a on, on a skate deck. Nike had gotten into the skateboarding business many times and failed. But then when they kind of made that observation, it's like, let's actually talk to the customer and see what they're doing. And they kind of just tweaked the shoe a little bit. And that's what created this, this billion dollar business of Nike SB. That whole observation of people who were already using a shoe that you made, let's just tweak it a bit instead of trying to do this other thing. And I, I look at that analogy on the gaming side, right? gaming and kind of working behind an, an off, like working on kind of spreadsheets and things like that in an office all day are very analogous, right? You're spending a lot of time in front of the screen. You want to be comfortable. Um, and, you know, there's a performance nature of, I need to perform really well to do my job. But if I'm a pro gamer, like I need all my tools around to help me perform, whether it's a mouse, whether it's my computer or even the chair I'm sitting in. And so that was a really great insight to kind of say, we, we kind of had a lot of the heavy, heavy lifting done we did some great partnership with Logitech and kind of took that kind of customer approach and then pivoted there. And I think that's where you look at the Embody coming through is just the, the right kind of insight by some really smart people connecting it through. And I think the market was, was definitely ready for it. Because if you look at the other traditional players in the gaming space, it, it just wasn't thinking of that performance side. And you know there was a, a definite opportunity. As a former skateboarder and a 50-year-old man who still owns a skateboard, um, <laughs> one of the things Nike, I thought, did really, really well was to take lessons from the skateboarding industry 
when they did that. Um, you know, I think Nigel Houston was brought on as a, as a pro athlete pretty early uh, in that process, if I remember correctly, and other kind of pros were brought in. And that sort of sponsorship idea is something that is very ingrained in, in extreme sports. You know, like it's, it's kind of the model for how you can actually make money at, at those sports. Did you bring some of that kind of sponsorship influencer kind of uh, methodology and thinking to uh, to Miller Knoll as well as you were thinking about that gaming chair? Well, I think I love your point. I think one of the things that's interesting just to even add is authenticity, right? There's a difference between, hey, I'll just go throw a bunch of money at someone yeah, um, versus partnering and being authentic. And I think that's the really kind of the level below that I think sometimes people forget in this whole kind of influencer culture thing. If you don't have an authentic real connection and people can see through that over time, right? And that's where that kind of deeper brand, you think about like, this is not something we're going to do for a year. This is about something we could be doing for a hundred years. So how does that kind of lens change that? And so I, I love there's some really smart people on this SB side that kind of like thought about it that way. And, and the same thing here. So I think you kind of have to look at the, the, the business as being different. So if you look at, I'll put gaming in kind of a separate part, there's that whole kind of influencer culture. There's obviously gamers and the partnerships and the teams and all that stuff that that's that part of that business. Those guys do a wonderful job. Of that. If you look at, you know, separate parts of the business, there's different influence is a weird word. Um, but that same framework can be here. I think for, um, if I look at the, the B2B side of it, it's really design and design partnership, which has always been the soul of both Herman Miller and Noel. Um, really, I think kind of that's, I don't know if the angle is the right word, but that's kind of the way we approach it is that that partnership with designers. If I would say that same analogy. So if I look at, you know, some of the great designers, obviously the Eans are the easy ones to kind of throw out through time. Like Don Chadwick, Bill Stumpf on the Aeron chair, some of the great industrial designers to even partners work with now. We just launched a chair with Nato Fukasawa. That was been what, like, if I kind of look at, like, I've gotten to work with like a Roger Federer in tennis. If you look at industrial design in Japan, Nato Fukasawa is like that level. And so if you are, an architect or a designer, that partnership and that level of, again, it's authenticity of you have a partner who is looking at something who is going to build for a space. You know, if I'm designing for a space, like that's my thing and it has to resonate with my vision and that kind of that connected part drives authenticity there. You're making me remember why I like the space so much. Yeah. <laughs> It's a, it's it's a, it's a furniture space is a, it's a great space for marketers right like because the, there's a there's an appreciation for aesthetic uh, uh, the industrial design elements etc not every uh, industry has that right yeah and 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 what's so interesting and and, and I think you guys have kind of looked at I I underestimated how complex this space is is like you have a lot of people involved in the process. And each one of them has a different kind of perspective on, on kind of where they want to go. And so if you look at design and everything you just talked about, that's one spot. There's the CEO of the company who's just trying to like, hey, I want to basically have a space that works, but engage my, my workforce. Um, then there's the functional side of like, how does this enable us to kind of do things? And so there's so many different levels of, of where that is. Um, that it adds a different complexity of where marketing is, especially on, on kind of different levels of it. I have a, I have so many questions left and we don't have a lot of time, but I am kind of, um, uh, so I'm, I'm curious as, um, as we think about the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the pitch to uh, facilities managers, managers, CEOs, larger organizations has a, a lot, you know, has had a, a strong component of of, um, of of workforce health as as part of the conversation around uh, you know seating and better work workplace ergonomics etc. Um, and uh, you know an investment um, in what you sell um, has often been positioned as having uh, delivering a lot of those benefits across an organization. Is that value? messaging that value proposition uh, are you seeing a lot of change in that 
when maybe um, companies can't influence uh, the home work environment as much? That is a fantastic question. Um, what's really interesting is it's it's kind of be, it's become a lot more sophisticated. So if you think about pre-pandemic, it was a little bit more simple, right? Is like we know people are going into the space, so we would talk about ergonomics, and and a lot of larger companies would have a workplace like their own ergonomist when they're making these kind of decisions for how to like people work. That's still underpinning some of it, but it's evolved in a different way. So if you kind of say what was traditional ergonomics, you need to sit a certain way to to really kind of make sure you're healthy and things like that. It's evolved into more holistic wellness. So that's one part of the wellness side of things. There's about the, why would I want to come to an office? That's a whole other part of wellness. There's that whole social cognitive side of things of like, now I want to, like, if I'm going to jump in my car and drive into somewhere, there's got to be something at the end of that, where it's like, it's table stakes that the place I sit has to be comfortable with those good things. But what are the other things in, in that space? And that's a whole kind of evolving discussion of like, how many, how big should your space be? Like this whole behemoth office we had before. Well, if only people are coming one or two days a week and they're coming different days, well, what does that space need to look like? And, you know, there's a lot of that conversation going on, not only within the furniture industry, but think about the office space and like, why does it like, so this is just a really interesting time where all this is pivoting. You know, there's not, 100% 100% answers for everything. And so that's what's really exciting is trying to figure that out. And, and I think that's that partnership of like who's doing it well um, and, and kind of taking from that. And I think that's going to be a, an interesting pivot. I think the other thing which is interesting, um, which has always been part of the industry but continues to elevate is like you talk about wellness, but sustainability is another big one. Um, you think about furniture um, just as an industry, um, it does take a lot on the environment. So that sustainability part is, is always been uh, there, but it continues to get amplified. It's like, how do we do things that become smarter um, and, and better? You know, Carmen, I'm thinking based on what Evan is saying, if we hadn't have delivered everyone at Kula a Hayworth Zodi chair at the beginning of the pandemic at home, maybe more people would want to come into the office now, you know, just to have a good seat. <laughs> <laughs> he's thinking well we should have probably sent them her miller chairs i know that but uh you know we, we had what we had <laughs> now the zodi is a fantastic chair i think that's what's what's um i think what's great about this industry is there's mutual respect for um the partners within it um there's kind of that set of rules and that's the one of the things i love is like we want to all make sure that if if we're going to build a, a great chair you have that experience and i think what you just said is really interesting, right? There's that that value of the people you work with and in an investment, right? And so I think that's this interesting hybrid space is like you've invested in your team and they see that and appreciate it. That investment's got to be a different way when they come to the office. Like they would expect that same kind of chair and experience when they come in the office, but they're coming in for kind of different things now, right? They want to see everybody and that social side and like, how do we make that space work in a different way? Because as much as like we can all sit in front of a screen, it's not the same level of effectiveness, especially when you're your design and creative side of that kind of getting everyone in the same space. There's something of that magic. And does it have to happen every day? No, there's some head downtime. So what's that right balance? And that's what's so interesting right now and exciting is like, how do you create that environment? And then how do you create a space that enables and encourages that? Well, and I thought, uh, you know, in my time in the furniture space, one of the things I loved is every June going to Chicago to Neocon. It was just a fantastic excuse to go eat a bunch of steak um, and uh, drink too much. But also, the Neocon is a real interesting kind of uh, crystal ball where um, every year, uh, the, especially the big furniture company thought leaders um, and, and, you know, and Miller and Noll are are certainly on you know at the top of that list you know they, they kind of show how the world of work is going to be changing i remember going into one of the showrooms there and like you know, there's reflecting pools beside desks and things of that sort and you know trying to you know point the way there's a kind of a, always been a part of of your business that's not just about responding to customer needs but in some way pointing the way to what will be that's got to be the hardest part of this job right now. How do you, how, uh, coming out of this pandemic, even knowing what will be, trying to predict those trends, that's got to be tough. 
Oh, for sure. And, and, and we have a lot of smart people that are, are I mean, I, that's a, a, a expertise that we have some really smart people looking at. Um, and what's interesting, right, is like there's a physical, and that's why like a neocon is so interesting. If you look at broader industries, right, that kind of trade show big kind of thing is is not happening. It's, it's kind of disappeared in a lot of spaces. Um, and, you know, that there's definitely a need for it because there's that exactly what you outlined is like, how do you see that? Like, how do you demonstrate that? You need something like like that. And, you know, I think when you look at that globally, right, there's a whole different part of like, how do you look at that experience and, and how do you think through it? Because it, it continues to be, yes, this is a place where people come in and kind of see everything there. But how do you balance it with the, the other side of it? And it's pivoted. So if one of the big changes, if you look at kind of Neocon in the past, it always used to be in the Merch Mart in Chicago, a wonderful old building. Um, it's kind of spread out because of this is like, how do you have a space that reflects that? So this old kind of hundred year old building that's kind of got these rooms of where it is, doesn't always kind of match with some of these broader things. And that's where we actually, we moved from the Mart uh, for that very reason is, so how do we customize and evolve? Because these spaces are changing so much. You need a place to demonstrate that in, in, in behind the scenes of the Mart. It's not always possible to do that in the space, especially with the complexity of the brands we have to do that. So what's interesting is that whole show is, um, you know, still a viable part in the mart, but it's expanded to other parts within Chicago. So your ability to get steak has like <laughs> amplified multiple times uh, because you have to go for multiple days and see different parts. And what's cool is there's a whole cadre of, of, of partners in Fulton market. There's, there's uh, some good restaurants in there and then you can kind of go into the mart and that's, this thing has become a really interesting event. And you would think it's kind of like slow down. It's actually only gotten bigger. Yeah. Well, That's now I want to book a flight and a reservation at Babette's. Yeah, we're all doing the steak trail or something now. <laughs> well, Evan, it's been uh, it's been wonderful to have you on the show. I've really enjoyed this conversation. It. Um, uh, thank you so much for for um, sharing your experience with us. Yeah. Well, thank you both, uh, gentlemen. This has uh, been fantastic. Uh, always fun to talk this talk around this stuff. It's always good to have people understand the industry and, and kind of ask some really great questions. Oh, thanks so much for being on. A pleasure. Thanks for listening to The Cooler Ring with Carmen Perry and Jeff White. Don't miss a single manufacturing marketing insight. Subscribe now at coolapartners.com slash the cooler ring. That's K-U-L-A partners.com slash the cooler ring. <laughs>